Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires we call the internets is Joe Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? I don't know. I'm a little upset with you, Mr. Strode. Again? I mean, uh, what? And it has nothing to do with, you know, somebody cleaning my room. No, I hear. I, 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 I bought your food, didn't to, I? Uh, to do a podcast yesterday, but uh, you, you kind of bowed out on it. Uh, you very, were at work. Very disappointed. You were at work. No, no excuses. No excuses. I, I planned it that way, by the way. You, you what? I um, we've talked in the past about my my unfortunate teeth. I've where, um, seen your unfortunate teeth. Where two of them were knocked out when I was in. Uh, my senior year of high school, they weren't knocked out. They were broken off at the root, at the uh, dumb line. Passages. By uh, rolling my VW Beetle and then uh, biting the steering wheel as, as the car rolled. And had you kept that Beetle in good shape, you could probably sell it as vintage and upgrade this here podcast. Uh, no, you weren't thinking about us. You were just thinking about how hungry and tasty that steering wheel would be. No, my dad actually totaled the was the one who totaled my VW. Oh, look at that throwing his dad under the bus. What a uh, what he, a son. What a son. He had to I, take the he I had to take it to work. Son does that to you? Uh, no, my son totaled my car too. Um, no, it, I, he <laughs> had it in the family. <laughs> he needed a car to go to work one morning, so he asked if I could use the Beetle, and I said sure. And then um, when he got home that night, he was brought home by one of his friends from work, and I said, "Well, where's the Beetle?" And he said, "Well, um, when I pushed on the brake pedal, nothing happened, so I had to steer off and <laughs> total the car." <laughs> Yeah, worse come to worse, use one of them damn trees. I uh, know he used a ditch, but oh. the ditch was a little deeper than he thought it was. Son of a ditch. So, uh, so uh, yeah, we don't have the BWB. But that, that, what was I talking about? Teeth. I was talking about teeth. So um, I need to have a whole bunch of dental work done. I've had uh, two of my long dental sessions completed, and I'm smart, Joe. You keep saying that I'm a genius. You want proof that I'm a genius? No, but go ahead anyways. I schedule my dental appointments when I know you are at work. <laughs> Damn. And you know why that is? Because they have to shove a big needle of Novocaine in my face. And I know that if you do, that I had a big face full of Novocaine. Oh, man, that would be podcast gold. <laughs> You'd be calling and Corey, we have to podcast. Uh, Chris we needs me to, to do this. And it. Okay, fine. I'm always looking to crazy you bother some stories. Because <laughs> that's just the kind of bastard you are. Yes, I learn from the best. Oh, who, who who's that? Well, you, of course. Oh, no. No, you I'm, are I'm, the original rat bastard. No, I'm a lou- I, I'm Uncle Rat Bastard. No longer a lousy that's, rat bastard. I'm Uncle Rat Bastard. I, I don't know. But I I'm, haven't. Uh, I'm also a goody two shoes. <laughs> nope. I think uh, as rat bastard is definitely it. But but what about me being a goody two shoes? I I have not been to the Strode compound in a while. I have no idea how many shoes you have. I have lots of shoes, and I still have the. Uh, pink Mother Jones shoes that you said were the prototypical Goody Two Shoes. Oh, sorry, I'm watching a video of a snake climbing up a guy's car while he's driving down the freeway. That's when you start weaving all over the damn road, isn't it? Yeah. (sighs) Well, if you are, uh, you didn't answer my question, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it would be math. Yes. How are you doing tonight? I'm not, you know, it's it's warm, I'm hot, uh, I, I'm wearing pants, but I'm not wearing a shirt, and uh, try as I might, I can't do the Hulk Hogan, you know, boob bob. But uh, other than that, not too bad. And, and how about you, Mr. Two Teeth? Um, well, I was very happy about Tuesday, even though I haven't had a chance to read much of anything, because Tuesday was box day. I know, and you you will not believe it. I opened my box. You did? Wow! Even as we oh, we're not to the unbelievable here, part yet. Let me know when we're at the unbelievable yeah, I'm part. I'm here three hours ago. I got it Tuesday, and I waited until Thursday to uh, to actually open it. 
not because I wanted to, but because I had to, uh, you know, go to work and, and uh, sleep and uh, eat and, you know, just things that just get in the way of comic book reading. Yeah, I know. I have a job and I have Notice I didn't say crapper eat. because, I, I mean, I can't tell you the number of comics I've read on the crapper. How, how many? I, I, I told you not to ask. No, you said you couldn't tell me, but I could still ask. Oh, well, I'm not going to tell you. May I remind you, Mr. Cray, that you are under oath. No, I'm not. I'm not Cromley. I don't have to. I thought I, thought I could get you. Damn it. Yep. Nope. Nope. There's no oath. No, no oaths here. Except the Green Lantern oath. I don't even have that. All I have is a red laser. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. <laughs> Whoa, I'll never catch that thing. Get back here. Ah! Ah! Don't, don't look! Don't look in the laser light, folks. I, I had a lot of trouble reading anything, but uh, one of the things in the box, and and um, I'm I'm pretty darn happy about it, and I can't wait for part two. What'd you read? What you what was that? The Marvel Monsterbus. Ooh! This was the all Kirby edition. Uh huh. It was not as thick as I'd wanted, though. Oh, Corey likes it. Cory likes it thick. Curry. I want my omnibuses to be <laughs> horse stunningly thick, like the you, gi- like like my giant size man thing. You want to be when you put an omnibus in your car, you want that back dragon and that front rising. So <laughs> when I put an omnibus in my car, I want it to be like I'm taking three fanboys to to the White Castle and they're all in the tub. back seat. It's a hot tub reunion. I did once. There was one time we we were at the shop, and I had a Mazda GLC, a red Mazda GLC. And uh, it was you and me in the front and three fanboys in the back. And it was literally, any time we hit a bump, it would be where the tires would scrape the top of the wheel well. The scariest the goddamn I drive I would ever on. Please stop. <laughs> it was boom. Oh, what the hell? And then I'd look at the back seat and go, oh, yeah, that's why. <laughs> Somebody recently asked a question about this here podcast, Joe. Well, I told the IRS we're not making any money off it. No, no, no. They asked, oh. what's a, what are some good episodes to listen to? And uh, I talked a little about that on episode 300. But, Joe, for you, what are, what are some episodes in, in this year podcast that you look back on and go, well, that was good? That was I. That was don't know. I don't really re-listen to them much. But anywhere I you try. remember going, hey, this is fun. Well, I think the ones where we were traveling to St. Cloud were pretty fun with Butch in the car. You know, they, we they got two more of those coming up. Fun. You know. Yeah. So those are those are fun. I post every so often on our Facebook page if people remember we have that uh, retro craze as I run across them and I think they're pretty good. Oh, so the ones that suck, you're not reposting. Uh, no, no, those I definitely, uh, I mean, I, but I don't, I block you off it. I want the friend, I want everybody to see you at your best. <laughs> well, that'd be like a five minute show. Wow. Have you seen Wonder Woman yet? Not yet. I, I mean, it hasn't been a weekend since we recorded. If you, you realize anyone in line seeing Wonder Woman is waiting for Gadot? Please clap. Wow. Jeb Bush still has a job. Well, we got to keep going. So did you read previews? I did not. But what I did do is, since I, for some reason I have an uncommon amount of number ones in my preview order this month. So I did a marathon reading session, and I thought we could talk about them this year on this year podcast. I haven't read them. I, I I don't actually look at the usually I look at previews right away, but like I said, I only opened my box three hours ago, so I'm gonna look at it after we're done. Why? What got right. you feeling already? I got stuff in previews that's got me pretty happy. Um, that? Probably the one comic that I've been waiting for for over 15 years. Well, uh, I don't know of any Grendel or Mage remake. What's that? The first full-size issue begins ten years after the climax of Mage the Hero Defined and finds the everyman hero, Kevin Matchstick, at an unexpected point in his life. 
It's been some time since he's unleashed the power of the reincarnated Pendragon, wielder of the mystical weapon Excalibur, despite his reluctance to fulfill what two different mages have declared his destiny. Dark forces have gathered once again to force Kevin into action. Through these events, Kevin keeps hoping for the same mystical guidance who has, that has mentored him in the past. Who is the third mage? Mage. Is that the zero issue or? Nope, that is issue number one. Oh, okay, because I I'm I'm going to be hardcore on that one. I am going to wait for the inevitable graphic novel. Issue one comes out on um, August sixteenth. There are four pages that you can read here in the previews. <laughs> they are offer also offering a dollar reprint of Mage Number One from way back in nineteen eighty four eighty five. And the hardcovers of the first two Mage miniseries, Mage the Hero Discovered as a hardcover, Mage the Hero Defined as a hardcover. Um, th- that, that, it's like uh, the, the whole universe is deciding they're bringing back stuff that Corey likes. You got Twin Peaks back, you got Mystery Science Theater 3000 back, you got Mage back, you Baby Got back, um, all sorts of stuff. And... Both Marvel and DC, because August is Jack Kirby's 100th birthday month, are putting out some stuff. DC's uh, got six comics that will be um, showing Kirby's characters as done by new creators. Um, um, And August is Jack Kirby's uh, 100th birthday. Not that he's around to celebrate it. No, but Marvel and DC are putting out some pretty cool stuff, as is IDW. Um, DC's putting out the New God Special, Newsboy Legion and the Boy Commando Special Number 1, Sandman Special Number 1, Manhunter Special Number 1, Dark Side Special Number 1, written by Mark Evanier, and um, Black Racer and Shiloh Norman Special Number 1, as well as the Kirby Fourth World Omnibus hardcover. That's right, the entire fourth world. Um, New Gods, Forever People, Mr. Miracle, Jimmy Olsen, and the Hunger Dogs uh, Hunger Dogs uh, graphic novel. All in a big omnibus. Omnibus. Uh, over at Marvel, that might be fun. Over at Marvel, they're reprinting a bunch of Kirby first issues at a dollar each. Um, I'm going to be picking up like uh, five or six of each of them to give away to people when they uh, want to know about Jack Kirby. And uh, if I had a lot more money, do you have your previews there, Joe? Nope. Okay. Um, I'm going to point out a couple pages to you here. Uh, Go into the IDW section. IDW, mostly known for all of their their license tie-ins, but they've also got their um, artist editions. So we've got Jack Kirby's uh-huh. The Mighty Thor Artist Edition, Jack Kirby's New Gods Artist Edition, Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four Artist Edition, Jack Kirby Commandi Last Boy on Earth Volume 1 Artist Edition, all available in August. And if, you know, you want to be even more rich, uh, two Bernie Wrightson Artist Editions are going to be available, too. Um well, no, they're artifact editions, not artist editions, and they're going to be 125 bucks each. So, uh, lots of money you can spend. So, stop listening to podcasts and get out and work some of that overtime. Yeah, go get a Take job. Get a job. Give some blood. Sell off your collection. Ooh, don't do that. Get a job, hippies. Yeah, stop taking pennies out of the penny dish. You bum. Did you read anything out of the box? Uh, we will get to that Ooh. when we get to freaking and geeking. But uh, as I said, the Marvel Monster Bus, that, that's been my very close friend the last few nights. He's curled up with an omnibuy. I spend more and more time doing that. Actually, uh, Tuesday night, when I got it, I had to do a sleep shift at the overnight at the group home. So I went out and sat on the deck and read the Marvel Monster Bus until it became too dark to read, and then I came in and got ready for work. 
I do not bring the omnibuses to the group home because um, uh, for the same reason I bring an extra set of clothing to the group home. There are things that get soggy, messy, and gross there. But you said you've been reading a bunch of number ones. I done did. You done did? I did done. Did, did, are, you, are you done? Uh, with them, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting for number two. Okay. Did you, you want to talk about them? Or are you done? Uh, well, I suppose. I mean, do we got enough time? No. I go on and on about the omnibu bye bye. Want to thank everybody for listening. Thank Can't you. Can't thank you enough for all the time. Oh, well, I suppose I'll let you talk, Joe. Okay. Normally, I edit out everything you say. Yes, I know. It makes for a very enjoyable <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Joe does. Joe actually thinks he's on this podcast. I do. But we all know Corey's the original rat bastard, uncle or otherwise. That would imply he has a nephew somewhere. I will have I to do. talk to his son. Actually, uh, I have told this story before. My niece actually gave me the name Uncle Rat Bastard because on the MySpace, my name was Lousy Rat Bastard, and she wanted to ask me questions about going away to college. So she sent me an email that said, Dear Uncle Rat Bastard. And I emailed her back immediately and said, That is the greatest name ever, and I cannot wait to use it. <laughs> <laughs> And thus, Uncle Rat Bastard was born. <sighs> and then we all know how uh, Joe became crazy writer. No, we don't talk about that. It's still sealed up under indictment. No, the the, the, the mini comic. Nope, nope. Not talking about it. Fine, I'm, I may reprint those mini comics. They're, they've got to be out of copyright by now. But I will. No, 70 years. Yeah, but um, I, I've looked at them, and uh, there's, there's no copyright notice. I would have a better claim at taking them than you would, because, you know, being that they were based on me and not given permission to use my likeness, nor was I fairly compensated for it. Oh, do, <sighs> did, do you think I'm going to say that I own it or anything like that? No, 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 I'll just print it. Gorilla printing the damn thing. Just I would like, do uh, that. I would just scan in uh, eBay or put it on eBay's. Yeah, just like uh, just like uh, Malibu did with uh, Mickey Mouse, see? Put out those early Mickey Mouse strips. Hey, they're out of copyright. And Disney said, well, maybe, but uh, we got better lawyers. So do you like Youngblood? Um, I, I I must confess, Joe. Joe, Again. you're Catholic, right? Wait, oh, go ahead. You're Catholic, right? No, not on purpose. I was, more, I was born into it. It wasn't, okay. a, I wasn't chosen. Well, it was okay. thrust upon me. Oh, you were an altar boy. Yes. Um, Nothing happened. I must have been ugly. Well, there is that. Nothing uh, happened in Boy Scouts either. You were really ugly. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of suing somebody. <laughs> Hurt my feelings. Now I grew up Methodist, and and we didn't have anything. To, we we didn't confess a damn thing. I mean, come on. Uh, the, the, the church service lasted as long as you know. And I, I talked to a friend of mine who was Presbyterian, and he was like, you know what? If I if I'm sorry, I just say sorry, God, and boom, bada bing, bada boom. Me, I had to go into a dark thing, and uh, bless me, Father, I touched myself in an impure manner. I uh, I, I touched myself. I thought things, but and and covet, Father, heavy on the covet. Oh, well, that's I, okay. Well, if you got an easy priest, it'd be ah, oh, that's okay. Day three Hail Marys, you're good. Sometimes you got Father O'Malley. Jeez, Joe, why'd you do that? Oh God, he knows me. <laughs> <laughs> Very embarrassing. Uh, but I don't know anything about confession, so could you kind of walk me through it? Ah, uh, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I uh, last confession was about a dozen and a half years ago. I did these following sins. I uh, d downloaded a free podcast. Uh, okay, uh, let, let, let me try it. 307 times. Okay. Bless me, Joe, for I have sinned. I, I can't bless you. I can, I can baptize you by spitting on your head in emergency baptism, but I can't bless you. It, 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 I, it's been a, a long time since my last confession. Yeah, when's the last time you had a drink? Hold on. Uh, last August. Okay, so it's been at least a, a year, almost. August five, August twelfth. Uh, I read the first issue of the new Young Blood. The current one. Yeah. And. and I liked it. I liked it too. I liked it. I feel dirty now. 
I didn't. I was always giving him a chance. I mean, there was that run that Alan Moore did briefly that was actually very entertaining. And uh, I think this kind of ties into it a little bit. And, uh, you know, they're doing the old uh, 25 years in the future. So as we're going along, we're being introduced to new people. We're getting caught up on old ones. And we find out uh, the world's a lot different. You know, they've actually uh, – Die Hard is president, commander-in-chief. Apparently somewhere along the line they have outlawed superhero groups. Uh, we catch up with Shaft and, and – uh, that shaft is one bad mother. Hey, shut your mouth. I'm just talking but, about shaft. Oh, I can dig it. He was in he was in uh, prison. Bad Rock was in prison. And uh, apparently they're going out to uh, confront the uh, current people who are superheroes that are, are trying to do it. There's also apparently a uh, little forecasting going on with some characters that look very familiar. And uh, it's actually done by Rob in uh, three or four pages at the end. But I thought this was a pretty good setup, and uh, it definitely makes me want to read more. More, I tell you, more. I was – one of the things that always bugged me, always, 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 always bugged me about uh, Youngblood was in the interviews leading up to it, Rob had this really great idea. It's like, okay, there are these young superheroes – who are media stars, and they're more excited about being media stars than being superheroes, and this is about their adventures as they learn how to be heroes rather than just, you know, superpower beings. And I was like, oh, cool, that's a cool idea. And then the first issue of Youngblood came out, and it's like, well, obviously he forgot all about that, because this is just a... unreadable. This is just a long fight scene that doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah, I mean, I remember our uh, artist in training, uh, our scrub Dave, he looked at this and go, oh, my God, look at this. This is terrible. He shoots the guy in the head, and he goes backwards, ah, uh, and then he goes forward, ah, uh, and he falls, and ah, uh, and there's there's no feet. And there's a, what? I mean, he was appalled by the aspect and everything on it. I mean, and let's remember, he like was crazy because it he was, was the, the audience. Time. Oh he yeah, was the audience. He was like what, thirteen, fourteen years old? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, it's uh, really good, and it actually plays off the idea that Rob talked about in the interviews. It never showed up in the comic. Yeah, which is too bad. And I did mention the Alan Moore run where they they did it. It was it was kind of interesting because Shaft is trying to re redo uh, the young blood, and I think eventually it just the uh, company imploded or something and it never really went anywhere but this kind of has ties into it so it would be interesting to see where they're going uh, I definitely worth picking it up I thought it was obviously since I bought it I do have to do a retraction though what? Yeah, we, I talked about the uh, free comic book day underdog you're, you're one shot take- you're going to take it back to all the bad things you've ever said about me on this podcast? Oh, hell no. Well, I would just to, you know, say a bunch of new bad things. But in this case, from American Mythology Productions, I got the first issue of Underdog Comics. I got it before the free comic book day, and I picked the comic cover that uh, pays homage or rips off action number one. And I read it, and it was damn enjoyable. I... I was actually impressed with it. I mean, it it has three parts to it. In between, you have the world of Commander McBrag, and it, it and then uh, between parts two and three, there's a quick go go gophers and topsy teepee, which is uh, you know they really didn't get too uh, incredibly racist with it, but it was still kind of fun. And the whole storyline was you know the old split. Uh, the villain somehow split Underdog and Shoeshine Boy, and it was interesting how it worked. And you would think after all the years reading comics, I would have seen how this thing would have ended, but it really it caught me off guard, which was fun. And then uh, at the end, they have a reprint of an old Underdog, either the Gold Key years or the, uh, the Carlton ones. I, I don't know which, and, of course, that was Drek. But... Uh, this was actually quite fun, and I may have to pick up some of our underdog as it comes out. So so go back in your podcast and that part where I was saying how bad the underdog comic preview was 
uh, erase it and uh, and uh, just pretend it never happened. If Stanley can tell us to go pick up our mint copy of of uh, Spider Man number three and erase Superman, Superman and put in Spider Man, hey, you know. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else I read. Oh, Although a, he did cover up the uh, Robert Banner stuff. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we didn't, I wouldn't call him Bruce, because Bruce isn't a manly name. No, he in a, the one of the early issues, he called uh, the Hulk Robert Banner through the whole issue. Mm-hmm. And uh, people wrote in and said, uh, isn't his name Bruce Banner? <laughs> so in the next issue, it was uh, Bruce is his middle name, and he goes by his middle name. So his real name is Robert Bruce Banner, but he goes by Bruce. Ah, that makes which, no sense. Which I thought was weird until the the woman who was briefly my my blushing bride, she went by her middle name, never used her first name. Matter of fact, there was one time I did use her first name, and she got real mad and smacked me upside the head. I, I could see that. How many people out there raise your hands want to smack Corey upside the head? I think there's uh, just uh, one person, but she'd like to stand in line and do it for the next 25 years. Uh, uh, you know, da, 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 some, some da, people's da, cleaning da, da, skills da, 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 are better than others. Da, da, da. Time to ask the Strode. Corey? Would you take me to Funky Town? What? Tell me who Dan Parent is. Dan Parent is someone who has worked at Archie for years and years and years and years and is currently doing a series called, um, oh, what is that called? Die, Kitty, Die. Die, Kitty, Die. And is the uh, creator on the newly announced old school version of Archie called um, Me and Archie. I mention that because I have issue one of Die, Kitty, Die, and I picked a a, uh, kind of a... I don't know what you call it, kind of like a Roger Rabbit type cover, you know, where she's wearing a, a dress with all the different images. And this was actually a, a fun issue. It starts out with uh, Little Kitty. It's showtime from the pages of Little Kitty 13, August 1999. And it goes forward where apparently that uh, Kitty number one is hitting the stands. And so she is there uh, signing books at a comic store. And, of course, they're... Uh, there's a lot of different references and a lot of different, uh, like, uh, yeah. Hey, look, all the attempts on Kitty's life made her popular enough to get a new series. Look at all those books. Actually, those are all the same book with 99 variant covers, you know. Or at the end, like, I wonder what happened to the original artists of Kitty. Are you kidding those comic book artists? I'm sure they retired to sit on a beach neck deep in cash and hot checks. Meanwhile, outside the window is a bum with holding a sign, comic artist. Please help. So hungry. <laughs> And it, this was actually a lot of fun, the, the, just as that Kitty's actually a, a witch, and she's trying to regain her fame via Kitty Ravencraft, number one. And she starts out in the comic book shop, and then it goes on to apparently she's allowed some doofus to uh, make deals on Kitty Entertainment so that they can have Kitty power tools and Kitty kitchenware and Kitty home pregnancy tests and Kitty water heaters. Uh, kitty keychains, kitty coffins, you'll never even know she was a comic book character to, you know, much when Kitty herself shows up is kind of like, ah, uh, say what? And when you get to chapter four, it actually uh, gets a little bit more serious and kind of ends on a cliffhanger. Uh, nothing says cliffhanger like a couple wooden spikes through the hands, but, uh, this one was actually kind of fun. The only real complaint I have, it's got one of those very, very shiny black covers. So I'm, right now I'm wearing surgical gloves touching it because I don't want to get my greasy fingerprints all over it. This is through uh, Astro Comics, if you're looking for it in the preview section. Meanwhile, there was a, uh, by the way, that's another comic that was started via a Kickstarter. So the Kickstarter people are the ones who got that one going. And uh, more and more of the uh, comic Kickstarters are starting new series. Um, the uh, Section Zero, which I just interviewed Carl Kessel about, he completed his Kickstarter successfully and is planning a second volume because it was so successful. And, of course, I mentioned the last podcast, uh, uh, Jane Ha and his comic series May. Yep. That started, started as a Kickstarter. Kickstarter. And uh, now is uh, – I didn't get a chance to actually talk to him at the con, which is too bad. Every time I came by, he was busy. There was a line, people not only getting his book, 
But if you brought in the Kickstarter book, he would give me a little head sketch, and then he'd sell you the graphic novel for 10 bucks, which about half price. That's a pretty good deal. But if you look back at, at the, the Archie comics, uh, I am way behind on reading them, but I did jump on an Archie number 15 because it's the start of a new storyline where uh, Josie and the Pussycats are coming to town, and there, apparently you get a uh, free ticket for a punch-out card if you go to the chocolate shop, as you know, our, uh, well, you know, all the gang did that, but, you know, pretty much Jughead, uh, I, I don't know how many punches he filled out, but he accidentally threw away his card. And upon complaining to Sabrina, the teenage witch, she decided to uh, uh, do something to help him and uh, get to the, the, uh, the uh, actual concert. Uh, and rather than, uh, you know, conjuring a ticket because, you know, it's hard to uh, anti-counterfeit holograms and conjure up tickets. So, so she, she casts a spell and, uh, well, if you've read your previews, I'm not really giving much away. But let's just say, uh, what, what's the one thing other than eating hamburgers that Jughead Jones is known for? Uh, his goofy hat. Uh, that's a time portal to you, mister. You obviously didn't read Jughead number two. Um, well, who's his girlfriend? That he's asexual? Yes. Well, what do you think would happen if every girl and woman in Riverdale suddenly decided they want a Jughead? <laughs> yes. And this is just the beginning, folks. That's at number 15. And uh, what's fun with the Archie comics is you can choose your variant cover, and they are not different prices. So in this case, I chose the Sandy Jarrell cover that has him in a record shop holding a copy of uh, Josie and the Pussycats while all the women are kind of like really looking at him, oh, I don't know, like a piece of raw meat. You could choose the Derek Charm or a uh, Savoie cover. Wah! Yeah. I'm not good at names. You know that. So that I was fun. I like wah! Ah, uh, let's see. As long as we're talking women here, have you checked out Ted Navith? Nifeth? Nifeth? Heroines. This one is I have from... I uh, I do like his stuff. SGP, yes. This was very, very good book. It's, it's very good. You know, I mean, thick reading. It's six ninety nine, a little bit more expensive. And it essentially... Uh, the, the premier character... And, of course, you know, I don't take notes, but her name is uh, Marcy Madison, and she is trying to form a superhero team of just women because the premier superhero team of the universe is just men. And when she goes up there to say, I want to kind of join, they really blow her off. So uh, shenanigans ensue, uh, good comedy, some uh, serious stuff. And, of course, when you get to the end, the inevitable cliffhanger. And uh, this is one. Uh, I don't know if this was a mini series or a regular series. And, of course, I don't misplace my notes here. Let's take a look here. Do you have notes? No, actually, I'm just looking at my invoice. I think this you might be a regular Chopra? series. Cause you, no, no, I just had to. I remember I had to check off my uh, what I got in my... Uh, my box from Discount Comic Book Service. But uh, this one does not indicate if it's, it might be an ongoing or it might be a mini series. But either way, check it out. Good stuff. Let's see what else we got. In the, uh, okay, they, they paid less for the first issue, so I'll give it a try department. For $1, you can go try The Damned from Oni Press by Cullen Bunn, Brian Hurt, and Bill Crabtree. See, nice, easy names I can pronounce. Uh, this one, uh, as I'm going through, it's apparently, it's kind of like a crime mobster, but it's got demons in it. And the demons are acting not so much like demons, but as mobsters themselves. So you kind of, it reads like kind of like a noir comic. And it, it, it basically from the introductions, you know, they talk about gangsters grow rich on our vices. Rivalries between criminal organizations result in bloody massacres. But unknown to the masses, demonic families control the rackets using greed, gluttony, lust, and other sins 
to fuel a lucrative trade in mortal souls. <laughs> and the main protagonist is Eddie. His soul was forfeit long ago, and he's been cursed for his trouble. He can die like anyone else. He just doesn't stay that way. Someone touches his dead body, they die in his stead, and Eddie crawls out to the gutter to get uh, kicked around a little bit more. So uh, he, when he opens up, he's working in a posh club with one hard, fast rule, no demons allowed. For a buck, this was, uh, you know, first chapter of a story, a good setup, and uh, I don't know if I'm going to continue this as a uh, series, but I will might wait for the graphic novel, but... It might be a cup of tea for a dollar you can find out. I think this is a brilliant way to, uh, you know, and again, I don't know how they're making money on this, but it's a brilliant way to get your book out in front of people. This would be the type when I had Hot Comics. They, they really didn't do a lot of that when I had Hot Comics. But uh, if I, when I had Crazy Comics, I would, you know, I had 50, 60 subscribers. I'd eat the 50 cents or whatever, plop one, hey, that's a freebie for you. Give it a try, see if you like it. What's easier is when they do like uh, Dynamite with Atari and they make it 25 cents. Because then I can only, you know, then it's like 12 cents. And they, they had one called Swords Quest, which is based on the old Atari game. I have zero interest in Swords Quest because I never played it when the Atari was out and I'm not real big on video game adaptations, generally as I'm reading through, if I run across it, I kind of skip over it. Kind of like when I see vampires are, okay, never mind. But this was a, kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know in, in the real world if I, if, I mean, Corey, did you ever play Sword Quest? Were you familiar with it? I was familiar with it. I did not play it because it, by the time it came out, the Atari thing was starting to die. And what it was, it was going to be four games, yep. and you would solve all the puzzles in game one, and then pay game two in game three. And I was a little interested, because there was a comic book connected to it, and George Perez was going to draw that comic. And he did, yep. Yep. but um, by the time the first game came out, I started doing the math, and that's when uh, video games were 30 to 40 bucks each. And minimum wage was three dollars and fifteen cents. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I'm going to have to pay 120 bucks to play the whole thing. No, nah, I'm not going to get on that train. And I don't think the fourth game ever came out. No, that's what sets up the the real world sets up the comic series because they talk about it in the back where there was Earth World, Fire World, Water World, and Air World. And the Air World game and comic were never completed. They never came out because of the video game crash in 83. And the the reward was supposed to be like a jewel-encrusted sword or something. So that's kind of the setup for the the comic. And again, for 25 cents, give it a shot. See if you like it. It kind of caught my attention, but I don't think I'll be following it. What was neat is as, as different things were going on, all of a sudden, a panel would stop game tip. Keep your eye out for hidden treasure. You know, just like a little tip would pop out. Game tip. Look for clues in familiar places. So, again, if, if, if you have nostalgia for that book or you just want to give something a try for 25 cents, you know, it's, it's worth giving it a shot. In terms of full-price books that I, I gave a shot, from Titan, I picked up Ian Livingstone's Freeway Fighter, and from this, this was just one of those that, uh, okay, fine, it had a woman protagonist, and it kind of caught my attention, but it's also a apocalyptic future. In the year is 2024, 20, not too far away. I mean, look what happened with Planet of the Apes and uh, Eugenic Wars and, uh, and Skynet and uh, hoverboards and uh, uh, anyways, 18 months after an unknown virus wiped out over 85% of the world's population, the remainder were faced with a new world order where violence and chaos ruled unchallenged. Former I-400 driver Bella De La Rosa is one of the 15% living every day as if it were her last. She's got to race her honing, or hone her racing skills to become a scavenger of the freeway and survive any way she can. Apparently it's based on a book by uh, Ian Livingstone, and I thought I'd give this one a try. It's a five-issue series, 
And uh, I may actually go look up the book because I actually enjoyed the comic quite quite a bit. It's gorgeous in terms of artwork. Another one I paid full price for was called Stained, a five issue miniseries from five four. I don't know if it's four five one or four hundred fifty one. It's a now. Uh, why did you pay full price? Well, I mean, if, in terms of it, I didn't get it for a dollar or twenty five cents or free like in Free Comic Book Day. Oh. So, and where did but, you, you know, buy it from? Did you buy it from DCB Service? Yep, all these came in. All these are box day things. Oh, so you read a whole bunch of stuff today? Oh yeah, yeah. How these dare are, you? Well, what, what it was is I saw all these number ones, and I'm like, you know, we usually will talk about number ones after I read the mini series. But I thought, you know, a lot of times I like to give you guys a heads up. Like in this case, with stained, if I can find the synopsis, it's kind of again, kind of like a crime type thing. The character has. I don't know what, what you would call it, like kind of a, a metal jaw. It almost reminded me of like Iron Jaw from the old Atlas comics. But uh, she's a lot tougher than that. And it, it becomes apparent she's a bounty hunter. She's going after some big-time bounty. And uh, there's something else going on in the background. But uh, And what's interesting is after the first issue, they give you a sneak peek of issue two. Which is unique, because most of the times when they do stuff like that, they just... Well, here's another one of our comic books we're going to fill half your comic with. Uh, this is three ninety nine, so it's actually priced in line with Marvel's. And again, I enjoyed the artwork. It's a little dark, a little grim, kind of futuristic. And uh, being that it's a miniseries, it's kind of... For me, it's right up my alley, because most of the time what I do is I wait and I put these together... And then just read them as one. And if I like it, I keep it. If not, they go on the old Ebays. So, but this is one I recommend uh, from our good buddies at Image via Top Cow. I picked up one called Samaritan Veritas. Veritas, I guess. Number one. And this is actually part of a ongoing series in the universe, which I guess they called the Edenverse. And... Uh, there was one I read earlier called Postal that was part of this. Think Tank is part of it. Uh, the the Tithe. Tith? Tithe? Tithe. Tithe, thank you. You should know that. You go to church. Well, you used uh, to. No, Catholics never give tithe. They just give. Uh, oh, you're not fall. required to give 10% of your income? No, no, no. That's a, that's a Mormon thing. No, no, no. That's a, that, that, um, we were told to do that when I was a Methodist. Yeah, well, that's your hang-up. We that's, were just told, that's the method, We were just told to give. And, keep and if, you didn't, if you didn't give, there was the fall festival, and then there was the booyah, and then there was the, the candy sale, and the wreath sales, and the candle sales, and the, and, and the envelopes, and the, and the envelopes had a special... Uh, anyways, we're not here and to talk about that. And the gambling nights. So basically, there are references in this particular book, Samaritan Veritas, of events that have happened previous, but that doesn't stop you from necessarily enjoying what's going on. And again, it's it's kind of a, a cop type thing. This particular character is uh, Samantha Copeland, and she is a hacker fugitive, aka Samaritan. And they uh, the government wants her in the worst way, but she is always two steps ahead of them, or so she thinks. And I picked this up just because it sounded interesting. Uh, I didn't realize that uh, there are other books you can read as part of it, and you don't have to uh, know anything else to follow along with it. So it is kind of fun. It's funny how most of the titles seem to, if you've, you're catching the theme here, at least for most of them, they seem to be futuristic, uh, kind of dark, and have a female protagonist. Hmm. I better change that. Let's take a look at Cable Number One from Marvel. That's already out. Wow. Yeah. And uh, let's see. I must have. Who the way did I pick this thing up? You like Cable? Uh, I no. I don't. I gave up Cable a while ago. Yeah, but you liked him. That's when you ordered it. You said it's because you like him. I'm trying to figure out who uh, who's writing it. Well, either way, it was he's popping through time, doing whatever Cable does. We have no idea what it is, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how he does it. This one I'm, I'm torn on, whether I'm going to keep reading it or just wait and uh, pick it up on the old Marvel Unlimited. 
But uh, I, I do like it as long as it doesn't plow into a crossover like the X-Men titles. I will probably stick with it for a while. <laughs> plow. <laughs> and uh, in some of the older books that we talked about, I mean, you talked about Ben Riley, the Scarlet Spider. And I finally read it, and I, I will add to it. I, I'm interested in it. Should be kind of fun. Then again, you know, Peter David's one of those uh, guys who could write the phone book, and I'd probably read it. I read part one of the DC Dynamite crossover, Batman in the Shadow. And i got to admit, I'm not big on the Shadow lore, but, uh, you know, he is really a creepy son of a bitch. They're making him that way, definitely in the comic, I know, through Dynamite. And when you mix Batman into the mix, it's hard to figure out who's the good guy, who's the bad guy in this particular one. It's a very intriguing book. Issue two is sitting in my pile, so I imagine I'll rave more about it next week. Uh, the Shadow's a character that I kind of know. I'm, I wouldn't ever call myself an expert, but I've listened to the radio show, which is different from the, the Pulp magazine. And I've read yeah. a bunch of the pulps. And he was kind of the first of the avenging pulp heroes. Um, a lot of his origin has been used by other characters. You could probably look at Doctor Strange's origin, and it's pretty much the same, except Doctor Strange became a mystic, and all the Shadow learned was the power to cloud men's minds, which usually was used for, you know, they... He was invisible, but he didn't become invisible. It was just he could use his uh, mental powers to make them think he wasn't there. And um, pretty much his uh, other power was that he carried a pair of 45s that he killed people with. Yep. Lots of blood. Lots of blood and lots of death. And um, what was the other pulp that I read? The Spider, because... You know, there was a time in the 70s when all these pulp heroes, they were putting them out in books. And I missed a lot of that except for Doc Savage. But then at the used bookstores in the 80s, they would have these, you know, for a half cover price. So I'd pick up Shadow and the Spider. Spider makes um, uh, the, the um, Executioner and the Punisher look like uh, peaceniks. He's like uh, ripping people's arms off and throwing them off <laughs> the Empire State Building, and yeah, the the violence in that is a little, a little, a little way <laughs> over the top, way over the top. Be interesting and, to see how they they run with the Batman on this one because so far it's pretty much just Batman trying to hunt down the Shadow. Yeah. And uh, it's I've enjoyed it. It's just, it's been a lot of fun. Usually, a lot of these I wait for the book, but this one is one that I actually picked up on. And that's pretty much it for number ones. I I, I did read. Uh, I got a free copy of American Gods number one, which uh, it it's kind of it's it's interesting to, to see this because I was reading. Uh, an article where they talk about people sometimes get resistant to, well, like with American Gods. If you've read American Gods, you've got in your own mind how you see the characters. And now with the comic book, which is based off the uh, TV show, which is based off the novel, that gets kind of taken away from you because now you're going to be basing it off what you see on the TV show. So some people I know are reluctant to want to get into the TV show. Some are reluctant to want to read the comic book more so. But, hey, P. Craig Russell artwork and Scott Hamilton's part of it. I mean, or Hampton. I, I enjoyed this. I'm not picking it up until the graphic novel, but I did pick this up as a freebie somewhere at, at the Comic-Con that came out. So, and I enjoyed this. Have you, are you either reading the comic or are you watching the show at all, Corey? Um, I am behind on everything, so no. I do have stars, <laughs> and I am planning on watching the series, not just because I love the book, but also uh, Ian McShane is on the show. And I am a huge Ian McShane fanboy ever since he was uh, uh, Swearingen in Deadwood. So I watch everything he's in. And um, once I get a little time, 
Uh-huh. I, I, okay, I, I'm already an episode behind on Twin Peaks. <laughs> I didn't have my TV on until today when it's like, oh, I should probably watch uh, The Daily Show from yesterday. That'll be pretty funny. I didn't watch much TV yesterday. I was I was too numb. I was yeah, comfortably numb and reading the the, the well, monster know, bus. I do know I do know a day you will be able to watch television. Uh, when's that? Well, it'll be October seventh, two thousand seventeen. Because while you're sitting at home watching TV, everybody else will be at Fall Comic Con, the one day wonder. It'll be held at the Minnesota State Fair Education Building, and. I'll talk more about it when we get to uh, Geekin, but I am on course to do my, my off. If, if One of the reoccurring themes of this here podcast is me trying to get my comic collection under control. And we've had things where I would sit and I'd say, these are the boxes I went through, and here are some of the titles I ran across, and Corey and I would talk about them. Uh, I've, I've been doing it on the Ebays. I've been uh, talking about you know, things that I've, I've dug up and read, you know, when we get to freaking and geeking. But this, the, I am on course for blowing out 99% of the comics <laughs> and things that I plan to never, ever read or collect again. Although, as you can tell by what we've just been talking about for the past, uh, oh, I don't know. 45 minutes or so? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not stopping picking up new things. So there may be another final, final sale for me. But this will be oh, so it'll be like uh, Pat Gruber's uh, final sales that went for what? We're now up to like 15 years now? Well, he didn't do one last time. Although he did bring a lot of stuff to the charity booth. So he was pulling out stuff there, which was kind of cool. So anyways, mark that date down, October 17th, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. They'll have uh, free grab bags for the first 400 people in. And, of course, like everything at the fairgrounds, free parking. There will be door prizes. they got a picnic area, although... October, it could be cool, and uh, it's a little bit smaller than the grandstand. It's 32,000 square feet, but it should be fun, and they will have advanced tickets starting at September 1st. Eventually, you can go to mcbacomiccons.com, and uh, that'll have all the information. Right now, I think everybody's still, you know, if you mention, hey, how's Falcon coming up? Ah! <laughs> Don't wake me up. I was sleeping. Yeah, I, so, yeah, I won't be home. I won't be home watching TV. TV. Watch TV. Well, I, I won't be. Oh, you won't. Where will you be? Um, well, it depends. I may be out of the country. Oh, you mean you mean what? I will be calling you, and you'll be saying, "Where in the world is Corey Strode?" Maybe, maybe. Ooh, this could be fun. Depends. You know, a lot. Of, a lot well, of different things have to fall together. It's a good idea to have some depends on, but and you know if that doesn't work well, the group home will probably call me and come in. Yeah, Corey, <laughs> we, know, we know you're in Europe, but could you come and do an overnight for us? Well, even if I'm not, you know, if I'm not, uh, you know, if it, the plan does not come together, you know, you'll be at the convention and I'll be uh, making money because at the last convention, I don't know how much money you spent, but I made four hundred bucks that weekend. I spent about seven hundred. Oh, so I raised over three thousand for charity. Well, there is that. And, of course, at this one, I'll be pulling out my comics. So. And spending every dollar on new comics. Eh, not necessarily. Well, Joe, you know who's not going to be spending their money on comics, but instead giving our listeners great service? And value for their money. These guys, our sponsors. That's right. Here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network, we have ads. And our first sponsor is me. That's right. Your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. I have my first book out with Dangerous Dan Moore. It's the first hundred strips of our online web strip, Worldwide News, the story of the lowest rated cable news network. And you can get yourself a copy with commentary, with all sorts of extras, with uh, signatures and everything. Just email Dan over at lordshadowflame at gmail.com. Our top sponsor, who's been with us since day one, is DreamHost. DreamHost.com. You need yourself a website, and DreamHost.com is the number one web host in the whole known universe. Just head over to DreamHost.com, put in the code CRAZY, K-R-A-Y-Z, get $20 off your first year. How can you beat that? Our other sponsor is Graze, G-R-A-Z-E.com. Healthy snacks for a healthy lifestyle. 
just head over to Gray's, put in the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. Your first and fifth box are free. You can get them weekly. You can get them bi-weekly. You can get them monthly. You just order a whole bunch of them. It's great stuff to keep you away from the vending machine at work. Now, if you would like to leave a comment for any of the podcasts that we do, we'd love those. Go ahead and email us at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com, or you can call 952-856-0519. Operators are standing by. Okay, it's just a place that will record your calls, but we'll play them on the air. We'll answer your questions. We love getting feedback. Tell us what you think. Ask a question. Suggest a topic. Be a guest. Send us your stuff. Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. If you would like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose radio shows, you can. Just email us at Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. Subject advertising. Thanks. After we do the sponsors, we ask Joe the age old question Joe, since it's summer, are, are you wearing the tank tops yet? No, no, no. It's Joe. What's going on on the eBays? I don't have tan lines. If you go to Mr. Stroh's website, go ahead, throw it out one more time. That's uh, crazycomics.solitairerose.com. This here podcast is a part of the vast and growing Solitaire Rose radio network, which just added a new podcast. Let's hear about it. Scrabbling across the West, a fortnightly retelling of Dave and Stephanie. Wait, fortnightly? That means every two weeks. I know what it means. What if we wanted to do it more or less often than every two weeks? <laughs> well, that wouldn't be holding down the fort, would it? Oh, you're funny. Okay, how about frequently? All right, I'm good with that. Okay. Scrabbling Across the West, a frequent retelling of Dave and Stephanie Kofel's adventures in traveling, making music, and playing Scrabble across the Western Hemisphere. It's all about the people, the places, and the game. Scrabbling Across the West. Bye-bye. Bye. See, we're, we're growing every day, Joe. And, and Corey says I don't give him segues. You don't bring me flowers anymore. I never did. You hardly talk to me anymore when I come through the door at the end of the day. Ooh, wow. See why you're here and not America's Worst Wanted. <laughs> <sighs> So if you go to that there podcast site on the, on the side, Corey has graciously put a web link to go to my eBay. So if you go there, you can you you first of all you, you're on the page that will have every item for sale that I have. And right now I have about six hundred nine. I recommend going up to that little blue box because in the blue box that goes to the crazy comics and stuff store page where you can actually go through, and if you're interested in, say, action figures, you can look at one of the four I have up, or you like them, they're variant covers. Well, I've got uh, about a hundred and, uh, well, about 89 different ones you can choose from, and I'm actually be putting on some more today. But one of the fun things I always like to do is just take a quick look at some of the stuff that uh, that uh, actually, actually sold. And let's see if I can get eBay to cooperate. Nope, something went wrong. We're sorry. Oh, you're going to be... <laughs> <sighs> See if I can find a back way into this. <laughs> Joe's trying to find a back way. His wife there usually stops go. him from that. Yeah, yeah, she don't like it. Corey, do, do you know I about... I can't believe I got away with that joke. Uh, yeah, well, we, I'm not the one that's going to come after you. <laughs> Corey, Chris doesn't listen. Tell me about Wow. Wow. The World of Ward, as in Bill Ward. Oh, okay. Was that a self-published thing he did? No, I think this happened after he passed away. Okay. No, I do not remember that. Let me take a look here. And when I, when I am confused and need to look at something, I go to my favorite lookup site called AtomicAvenue.com, and they have an allied American artist did a one-print reprint I'm sorry, a one-issue reprint of Bill Ward's voluptuous artwork. And it was called, wow, the world of Ward. Wonderful, wonderful world of Ward with a lot of W's in the title. They are very expensive if you can find them. 
mint copies run about a hundred bucks, and mine was very fine near mint, so I sold it for a mere thirty. Corey, have you read any of Project Superpowers? Yes, um, I. When it first started, I tried it, and like a lot of stuff from Dynamite, it started spreading out into a whole bunch of different books, and I couldn't keep track of what order to get them in, and it's okay. I'm tapping out. And then they did. I think every company has to do this. They did a Warren Ellis reboot. And the first <laughs> hey, two Warren, issues what are you came... doing this month? We need to reboot something. And the first two issues came out, and then um, they were delayed. By the way, I, I need, I'm need i going to look something up while you, while you discuss Project Superpowers, which was actually kind of a cool idea where they took a bunch of public domain superheroes and put them in a single universe. Yeah, there's there were some other series. There's Project Superpowers, and then Chapter Two, uh, Prelude Sketchbooks, oodles of variant covers. Uh, there's Project Superpowers Black Cross, uh, Hero Killers Meet the Bad Guys. But essentially, like Corey said, what they did, it's the beginning of the age of superpowers with the closing of the Second World War. There are stories to be told of the great missing superpowers, and all of them are essentially. Public domain characters, I guess. Yep. Alex Ross did a lot of the covers. Uh, I'm looking at, like, uh, number one. Actually, n- number zero has, like, five different covers. Not a lot of them are pricey. There's a few ap- that do go expensive. And, you know, for, for the price, you can just pick up. I don't know that the regular covers are fairly excuse me, inexpensive, and they tend every time they revisit this to start with, like, the what I talked about earlier, like a quick 25-cent starter. But I don't know if they're currently doing anything with Project Superpowers now other than, you know, just having the book reprints. Uh, when you got to Chapter 2, it went, oh, boy, 12, 12 issues. And let's see... Well, other than uh, you know being overseen by Alex Ross, I you know I've never really read it. I, I haven't collected it, and I, I just uh, I never really got into it. I guess like you said, Corey, eventually they started breaking into so many different characters, and there were so many different variant covers and things. I just kind of lost track of what I had and what I didn't have. Fortunately, they are available in book format, so that might be a good way to to try to catch up with it. Uh, I'm uh, taking a look here in the uh, DC previews. I do not see the Wildstorm. The Wildstorm? Yeah, the uh, Warren oh. Ellis reboot of the Wildstorm uh, books. Hmm. I, I'm not because I'm, in February they said, oh, and by this summer there'll be four Wildstorm books that spit out of it. And I'm looking, and uh, and uh, there's a whole lot of nothing. Yeah, a whole lot of nothing. And I'm trying to find um, issue five. Let's see. Issue five is supposed to come out. Speaking of a book, uh, issue five is supposed to come out 621. Let's see if uh, issue six has been solicited. I'm being a jerk, aren't I? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) <laughs> you keep talking. I'm going to keep looking here. Well, the question I have for you is, tell me about Aesop's Fables. Uh, Aesop's Fables? Yes. Was it that uh, one of the cartoons? No, that was Aesop and Son. Yes. Um, Aesop's Fables, was there a comic? It was. It was 1991 from Fan Graphic Books, where they took uh, the stories and, and uh, things from ancient Greece and... Had a ton of creators on them: Fred Hambeck, John Cadwell, Peter Cooper, uh, Stanley Goldston, and three issues came out from Fan Graphics, and then it quit. So, but it's something to pick up if you're interested in. I just sold my issue number one. Not expensive, so you can uh, enjoy it uh, for not a heck of a lot of money put out. And let's see if. Corey uh, is uh, up to date on his uh, Superman Adventure comics. Corey, what was, in 1998, what was significant about Superman Adventures number 21? So significant that that issue is higher priced than any other one. 
Wasn't that the uh, 21 stories by 21 pages? Uh, each one was a story by Mark Miller? No. Well, I know it was by Mark Miller. No, this one was uh, the first appearance of Supergirl. The uh, Oh, the animated version animated. of Supergirl. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Evan, Evan Dorkin, Sarah Dreyer, and Brett Blevins did the art. And while the guide says it's five bucks, they are not selling for five bucks on eBay. They're selling for quite a bit of money. So if you have a mint one and you need some quick cash, drop it there on the eBays. Uh, I'm still loading stuff up in the eBays. So if you see anything you want, like I said, follow that link through Corey's website or just go right to eBay, K-R-A-Y-Z. And I always, if I know you're a listener to this show, I like to drop in a little extra or something from our vast accumulation of stuff. Stuff that I have sitting around, uh, it could be, uh, well, maybe this here Hot Wheel that, that Spider-Man's on. Maybe maybe I'll give you a copy of the Q-Zone book that I just finished reading. Or maybe a, a picture of my, uh, when I was like 18 and had lung surgery. Mm, no, I better keep that one. Yeah, you so, better keep that one. Yeah, better keep that Crazy, K-R-A-Y-Z, come, come get some. Yeah, I'm not finding uh, the wild storm being solicited in last month or, or this month. Wild storm. And- I so, think uh, you are already gone. You weren't <laughs> anything groovy. <laughs> Do you remember the reboot they did a few years ago? Where, oh. um, who was it? Grant Morrison was going to be writing uh, Wildcats. And I think, like, only one issue came out. <laughs> oh. so, I, you, know, you know, and it's a shame, too, because they... Uh, I, I was just thinking, and, and this is one of those, uh, oh, God, he's going to talk about fan fiction. But, you know what, I'll, I'll wait. When we get to, to geeking, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But I just I, I thought of a way you could bring back these characters that might be exciting, although I have no idea if they'd stick around. I, I swear, are we getting into a where fandom, at least for Marvel DC, does not give a damn unless it's, the original characters I grew up with. I don't want the female version. I don't want Wildstorm version. I just want Superman. I want Spider-Man. I want Iron Man. Well, if you look at the sales, you know, DC learned with the New 52 that if it's not Justice League or Batman, you're going to have trouble selling it. Once Jeff Johns left Green Lantern, you know, they had, I think, like four or five Green Lantern books. And when he left Green Lantern... Nobody cared. Um, Superman, they're doing what they can, and Superman does okay. But Batman is the engine driving DC. At Marvel, it was the X-Men that was the engine, then it was the Avengers that was the engine. And now that um, Secret Wars is done, they don't really have an engine. Woo-woo! And I think that's more what the problem is than anything else. They don't have a book that comes out and kicks ass every month. DC's got Batman. And Batman has been the number one seller for DC since, uh, like, 87. And everybody forgets that, you know, through the late 70s and into the 80s, Batman barely held on. But it was weird, because Batman would win the Favorite Character Award in the Comic Buyer's Guide every year. But the sales were in the toilet. So you kind of knew that people wanted to like Batman, they just didn't like what was being done with them. But I think it's, I think part of it is that, like John, I think we have a lot of people in comics who are like John Byrne. Who, um, I want comics the way they were when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, want, to, I want them to grow up that. with me. I want them to grow up with me, but I don't want them changing too much. You know, like Spider-Man. Oh, Spider-Man's married, and Spider-Man got married, and I want him to stay married. I don't want that to ever change. I don't want Aunt May to die. I don't want this to die. I don't want him to have it. I want him to stay a college student or, forever. Or, better, or people like you. You're like, you know, Spider-Man only works because he has his core characters, and you haven't touched any of them. We don't know where Harry is. We haven't seen anybody. We haven't seen Flash. So let's unmarry him. We'll put him back to his basics. And it worked for a while. But what they're still... forgetting is, like what Stanley would always say, it's not that you change it, it's just the illusion of change. Right. And, and what... one thing that Dan Slott does is he has these changes that feel huge, and they're a lot of fun, but he also knows just how far to stretch it. 
when he's not Before done. Before it's okay, we're going back. He's not done either. I mean, it, yeah. it's one thing when, you know, Walt Simonson got a hold of Thor and he turned him into a frog and he did all this wonderful stuff. But then he had the sandbox rewrite it when it was done. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it, it gets away. I mean, like, I have no idea where they're going with the Jane Foster, <gasps> spoiler, slash Thor, but it is entertaining as hell, and they're bringing back the original Thor. So, uh, and again, sometimes maybe the character's just not for you. You don't like the little female running around pretending she's Iron Man? Well, maybe the book isn't necessarily for you. Right. It's okay to set it down, step aside, maybe return when Tony comes back, and not if, when. I've done that a couple times. I mean, there, there's gaps in my run where I'm like, what? Did, oh, yeah, that's right. I I dropped it and decided not to pick it up anymore. Or, uh, you know, I just, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm just like, it's just not for me. And sometimes I'll read a book that's not for me and find it's it's utterly charming and fantastic, like Ms. Marvel. You know, when I read the graphic novels a uh, number of podcasts ago, I was like, this is a fantastic book. And I can understand why I had to wait patiently for the kids in the library to set it down so I could pick it up and take it out and bring it home. <laughs> See, kids, that's why you have to have a library card. <laughs> and one of the things that people forget, well, I, want, I want my character the way it was. Well, that character didn't sell well. Um, the Wasp is a perfect example. You know, Janet Van Dyne as the Wasp was a supporting character. She has never headlined a book. She's never carried a book. She's never been popular enough to carry a book. The new version of the Wasp, it's one of these new Marvel kind of um, light, um, positive female characters like Ms. Marvel, like Squirrel Girl. Those sell really well. Um, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur sells like shit in comic shops, but it sells unbelievably well through other markets. So, hey, let's do a Wasp series. Here's a new version of the Wasp who's that same sort of, you know, young, teenage, optimistic hero. And I think that's the other thing. It reminds me a lot of the 90s where everybody had to be in trauma all the time. Yes. And then Mark Wade came Wait, along and I'm... said, I'm going to do The Flash. And while dramatic things will happen, it's going to be fun. Oh, yeah. Why? Because superheroes should be fun. It doesn't have to be pain and your gloom and death Dash and of misery. Tea. and. But I don't, you know, I, you're reading article after article after article after article. One of the main things that Marvel's got is that they built up a, a killer bench. You know, Mark Miller, uh, Bendis, Ed Brubaker, Jonathan Hickman. You know, just go down the line. Abnett and Lanning. All of these people, they had a killer lineup. And eventually the guy said, I'm tired of working in the uh, corporate atmosphere. I want to own my own stuff. So they go to Image, and everybody says, whoa, they only sell about half to a third of what they sold at Marvel. Yeah, but they're keeping a hell of a lot more money. And they're in charge, and they don't have to tie into anything, and it's theirs. And if they sell the movie rights, it's theirs. And so Marvel didn't work on replenishing its bench. DC, on the other hand, with Rebirth, they've kind of brought a lot of their books back, but it's still the Batman books sell. Anything connected with Batman sells. Superman's in the middle of this big, you know, dramatic, super crossover story arc that ties into everything. Wonder Woman should be selling a lot better. The Flash should be... The Flash is on TV. It should sell better. Green Arrow's on TV. It should sell better. Green Lantern should sell better. Everybody's having trouble because the market's just not there. The market has splintered. It's like radio. When I first moved here, you had AM radio and you had FM radio. And that was it. And if you wanted to listen to music in your car, you had to buy a CD player, which was expensive, or a cassette player, which was crappy. But you listened to the radio. And radio made money hand over fist. Well, by the 90s, CD players got cheaper. And radio stations got bought up by big corporations because they got rid of a lot of the laws that said that you couldn't own... You, 
there used to be limits on how many stations you could own in a market and how many stations you could own overall. And they got rid of those. So Clear Channel went and they bought up everything they could. And they went, well, why should we have a DJ in Minneapolis and Atlanta and Nashville and San Diego and Spokane when we could just have one that does the album-oriented rock for everybody? And we have one that does the top 40 for everybody and one that does country music for everybody. The problem was when you got away from the individualized radio, people were like, well, if they're just going to play music, I'd rather play the music I want to listen to. Audiences started to go down, and they went, oh, crap, we got to play more stuff that everybody knows. We have to make our, set, our, uh, our, our um, music list smaller, because if people hear a song that they don't know, they're going to tune away. Which is an interesting thing when they talked about alternative rock, because those fans are the most... Uh, crazy of all because, well, we don't want to listen to it because it's not new and refreshing. But then when it is new and refreshing, they don't listen to it because they don't recognize it. Right. And so mo- with the exception of the public radio channel and college radio, you most of those channels have drifted off into the Internet or like Cirrus, you know, where you pay to get it streamed to you. Yeah. Or more and more people, they sign up for Pandora. They sign up for um, – Spot- they, they get Spotify – and then they use their phone and stream it to their car. And radio does worse and worse and worse and worse to the point where there's a big fight going on. And I'm surprised it's not being reported on more. Auto manufacturers are saying that it, the next generation of cars they make will not have AM, FM radios. Why not? Because nobody wants them. <laughs> People want to have, you know, Bluetooth. They want to have streaming. They want to have this. They don't care about local radio. And local radio's freaking out. I still remember, late 90s, I was driving into work, and I wanted wanted to get traffic, because I was driving. I wasn't riding the bus. So I wasn't listening to a CD. And the DJ on the music station went on a 10-minute tear about how you shouldn't listen to CDs in your car with these fancy changers because you're fiddling around with the CD, trying to get the song you like, and you're not paying attention to the road and you'll crash. Whereas here on the radio, we're going to play the music that you like, the music you know, and we're going to give you information. And it, it was, it was sad. It was like when Garth Brooks went on The Tonight Show and started crying that people were buying new CDs. Because he'd been sent out there by the radio, by the uh, music uh, companies, who had given up fighting record stores selling used music, which they you know tried to do in court and they lost that. So they told him, "You need when you go out on these talk shows, you need to talk about how people selling and buying used CDs is taking the money from your children's mouths." It's not the fifties anymore. People are going to find different ways to to get their entertainment. Like with you and me. Hey, I love Marvel. Got that Marvel Unlimited. I can wait a few months to read these books. I'm behind on everything anyway. And now it's time. And now it's time for my favorite part of the show. Corey goes on a 10-minute rant talking about (laughs) how (laughs) Corey goes on a rant about how comics and radio are all fucked up. Sounds like a podcast to me. Uh, no, no, it's my favorite part of the show. It's uh, Is there a video out there of uh, Christina Hendricks uh, d- d- doing burlesque? No, 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 no it's freaking no. a geeking. What are you, Joe, what are you freaking on? The fact that I talked for ten minutes wouldn't let you... No, no, actually, it was, it, I, I, I just wish I'd have fired you up earlier in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you put a quarter in me and I'm I good. put a quarter in him. I, I don't have much I'm freaking on, to tell you the truth, and... Uh, the only thing really bugging me is just, you know, it's that time of year we get nice weather, high pressure, my rheumatoid starts feeling creaky, and so it takes me a couple hours to get going and get warmed up, which is why I sat and stared at my box half the day before I opened it. Oh, you podcast in three hours. I better look and see what's in it. But uh, other than that, things aren't, aren't doing too bad. But, you know, this isn't geeking, this is freaking. Let's see what else. Uh, oh, yeah, my favorite pen ran out of ink. Okay, that's pretty much it. Corey, what are you what are you freaking on? Joe, you know how I've been talking about at the full-time job, I've had to take, you know, like 
60, 70, 80 calls a day when normally I take 30 or 40. Mm -hmm. Monday I took 172 calls. With your mouth full of Novocaine. No, that was Wednesday night. Okay. No, Monday, no, 172 nervous. calls. We Hello? got... Can I help you? <laughs> yes, this is a time. What kind of this I am? May I have your name and some of the family number, yeah, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, T. Vega, I'm in <laughs> and a lot on Flint. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we just got hit hard. Um, it was a uh, deadline for one of the clients, a poor decision by another one of the clients, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the day, there were over 50 voice messages for people who, you know, you've been waiting for 10 minutes. If you would like to leave a message, press 1, press 1. I had to call them all back before I went home. Did anybody else stay and do the callback show? Of course not. So uh, Monday I got home, and I was pretty much exhausted. Um, it was the first night I got to sleep in my own bed in a week, and uh, I pretty much just walked into the house, threw, threw stuff on the couch, <laughs> went into the bedroom, <laughs> laid down, computer, you know, play this song. <laughs> and by the end of the song, I was asleep. Just boom, done. Oh, the your computer hurt me. Um, you know who else hears you? Apparently, spiders across the room can hear you, too. Why? Because so you're you running and hiding? But when you fart, you're never alone. Oh. Damn. Um, and uh, I cleaned out the fridge <laughs> last night. Could be meat. Could be cake. Well, you know, it's uh, one of those things where, you know, I was working at the group home so much, and I wasn't home much, so I opened up the fridge, and all the time I'm throwing away, ah. Oh, I wanted to eat this lettuce. Thump. Oh, I wanted to eat these blueberries. Thump. Oh, I wanted to eat these strawberries. Why are they all fuzzy? Thump. <laughs> it just yeah. made me depressed. Because <laughs> it was, you know, I would wake up in the morning and go, I'm just too tired. I'm just going to have a diet soda on the way to work. Then I get to work. It's like, oh, crap. I didn't have time to make anything for lunch. Uh, good, good. I've got little, little little macaroni and cheese cups. It's like, guys, all threw that in the microwave. Then I get home and it's like, I'm just gonna have a glass of milk because I gotta go to work. So uh, the fridge is really, really clean and empty and barren now. Reminds me of somebody else's fridge. Uh, Joe, <laughs> what are you geeking on? Well, that's more entertaining. <laughs> Speaking of Jeff Jones, we I. Uh, the first thing out of the box. We were talking I, about Jeff Jones. I ha we we did talk about him, and I had to read the uh, Flash Batman crossover where they're oh, dealing Jeff with Johns, that, Johns, Jones, Jims. They're dealing with that freaking button, and I don't know if you've read yours, Corey, but yes. Oh, it was fun. This is this. You know, I know we're, we're all groaning what's coming, but. I enjoyed it, and, and in case you didn't know, you read Batman first and Flash second, and if you didn't catch the part three, part four in it, there's not really much hope for you, but of course, the best part is, as you get to the end, and well, I won't say it, but the, the, it is tying into something, so oh, I, I, I will be looking at previews definitely when we're done. Uh, other couple comics I picked up. Uh, I think I talked about this one last week, but I finally read the, as I was going through my stuff, one of the things that's happening is I've been able to really go through a lot of boxes. Now that I know I don't have to bag and board the comics, I'm going to be just bucking out. I'm, I've gone light years from where I've been, you know, earlier, because before I was like, okay, I'm going to bag and board these, so just put them in a pile, and then I'm not going to do anything with them. Now I'm going through, if anything, you call it deboarding. You know, I've got a whole box now of of uh, boards that I, you know, I took the bag and bore out. Unless the comic's really beat up or like a, a little mini comic, and uh, they're all just going to go for a buck. And one of them I pulled out just to read was X-Men Unlimited 32 that had the Dazzler back in the spotlight. It was a fun little, little, uh, uh, I'm trying to look, we did it, Will Pfeiffer and Jill Thompson, uh, kind of doing a Dazzler beyond the music if you watch him. TV and uh, or VH1 behind the music, and then they had the gift that had Mike Diodato Jr. art with Nightcrawler in it, which was a lot of fun. And then 
All Swell That Ends Swell, which was kind of a an interesting story that dealt with the uh, Star Jammers, and that's the uh, the you know Cyclops mom Chod, uh, the the gorgeous female thing he's dating. Why the Star Jammers and the Guardians of the Galaxy don't meet up? Because this story that I read, I could have just, you could have easily put the Star Jammers in, and or I'm sorry, put Guardians of the Galaxy in, and just replace everybody accordingly. And, you know, you really, Marvel, I'm giving you a million-dollar idea here. You need to get the Star Jammers and the Guardians at least in a crossover. I mean, it's it, probably impossible to do it on the in the movie because I suppose they could say Star Jammers are, are part of the X-Men universe. Fox, I just gave you a million-dollar idea. Make the Star Jammers your version of Guardians, or well, everybody will look at it and go, ah, it's just a Guardians ripoff. But it was a fun little story. And, you know, you think about these properties that Marvel has, you know, we've talked about the sales and they don't really stick, but boy, just, hey, that's what they did with Miss Marvel. They make a quick six issue story. If it sticks, we'll continue it. If it doesn't, uh, you know, it's over at six. And if it does, we'll make a thousand titles out of it. Dr. Strange, I'm looking at you. Uh, reading, I reread. Uh, I've talked about this before. This is, you, you, you talked to me last podcast about uh, a cherished item, you know. Uh, this one, comic book-wise, is one of them. It's Jason's Young Bluth Weapon Brown. And I've gabbed about Oh, yeah, you told, you've talked about that a lot. Holy crap. I th- and I read this one slowly, and I'm still catching, you know, series like, oh, my God, that's uh, the kids from Fat Albert. And, and oh, there's, there's Opus, and there's, uh, uh, you know, Pogo, and, and it just, it's a fun book. You're never, ever going to find it, because I cannot believe that many people who bought it are just going to cough it up. But if you ever get a chance to find it on eBay, snap it up, and I guarantee you're going to have a blast with it. I don't think he uh, he's done anything with this since it came to an end. Um, and I will, I'll will i look up his website, and maybe if it's there, it's uh, weaponbrown.com. But I don't think there's anything there anymore. But, yeah, just I reread it. It was fun. I talked about reading Sandman. Well, I finally picked up a book called The Neil Gaiman Reader, edited by Daryl Schweitzer. And this is a book that came out from Wild, Wild Side Press. And it's basically a bunch, in my opinion, of Hotsi Totsi's writing about how smart they are about Neil Gaiman's writing. It's entertaining. But, uh, you know, some of it reads... Uh, well, actually, the first one was actually a guy talking about uh, Campbell and the Sandman reminding us of the sacred. And he said this was actually, a, I guess, a college term paper. And some of it I skipped over because they're dealing with books that I haven't read yet. I mean, believe it or not, I've never read Violent Cases. I've never read Star Reach, uh, some of the earlier works. Uh, I barely remember reading Mr. Punch. But uh, it's all there, and they talk mostly about Gaiman's work. The book came out in 2007. Uh, They do talk a lot about American Gods, which is fun. It was just kind of a fun read to go through. I mean, a little pretentious, I suppose, in times, but I enjoyed it, you know. And, again, it was something I wasn't going to read until after I reread Sandman. Uh, Box Day, I still got oodles of box stuff. I mean, I shared the stuff I slapped through first. I got a ton of image first to to browse through, and I got three books I'm very excited about. The first one is Bitch Planet uh, through Image. Again, this is a a uh, creator-owned series, and I can't read the writing on the cover because it's really funky colors. But this one is uh, Book Two, President Bitch. You can't jail the revolution, so I can't wait to see where they go with this one. I got Volume Four of the New Avengers by Brian Michael Bendis, and I, I'll, you know, this is old stuff, but I'm going to ask the Strode a quick question. Did they ever cover who it was that created the breakout on the raft? Oh, because I know I know they did, but I can't remember who and where. Because I know, you know, as I'm reading this, you, you read the Avengers, and then it gets into the Civil War, and then they break off into, a, you know, New Avengers, Avengers, Dark Avengers, Mighty Avengers, uh and the new Avengers become kind of the ground troops with Luke Cage, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange. Uh, there's a lot of Civil War crossovers. And I'm thinking, 
you know, and again, this is monthly. So as monthly it unfolds, it's like, yeah, this is fun. But when you sit down and read it in a book form, it's like, I totally blank. Who covered it? I mean, why? What was the whole point? Um, and, of course, they dealt with, with, you know, something rotten going on in S.H.I.E.L.D. And um, I, who knows? Maybe I'll find out in issue five. Or maybe I'll have to go pick up the Dark Avengers compendium. I don't know. The other one I picked up is one I'm very excited to read because I have never read it. Books of Magic. This is, uh, oh, I can't even think of his name. With Timothy Hunter. Uh, the original Book of Magic, again, a Neil Gaiman book, was where he showed up and they kind of were trying to re-envision magic for the DC Universe. Uh, don't worry, they didn't. But it's they take this and then they spun him off in his own series, Books of Magic. And again, this is one of those things that I, 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 I dislike because I know Ken Berger decided, okay, Vertigo's one thing and DC's another, but they'd had a thing in books, Book of Magic where Tim became the biggest villain in the DC universe and is shown basically holding, if I recall right, holding Superman by the chops, kind of looking at him like, huh, and all the other heroes are decimated, which is why... In Book of Magic, the, the character Mr. E, get it? Mr. Letter E? Mr. E? No, yeah. I, never mind. Um, he was so ready to just kill Tim. Uh, spoiler warning, he didn't. Hence, Book 1 of Books of Magic. And I can't wait to read it. But again, these are storylines. DC, you, you, you got it sitting there. Bring him in, wind him up, let him go. You know, I mean, you, you got your villain. Sure, you had to kill Darkseid, but uh, ah, he'll get better. So, anyways, I'm looking forward just to reading these because I've never read them. I mean, I've read bits and pieces of them, but uh, this should be a lot of fun. The first book covers 1 through 13 as well as the Arcania Annual. So, I got some fun stuff. And you know I'll be revisiting them once I wade through them. That's pretty much it. Uh my wife's eye surgery went really well. She's doing good. We we may try to go see Wonder Woman. Uh, kind of bummer is they don't do matinees on Saturday anymore. It used to be the first show would be the cheap one. Nope, they're jacking them up full price now. And uh, since I work Tuesdays, I can't go to the $5 Tuesday movie anymore. So we haven't decided if we're going to do it or not, but we shall figure it out. Corey, what are you uh, geeking on? Uh, first off, the person who caused the raft to shut down was Electro. He's the one who uh, caused the uh, issues. Yeah. I'm not seeing who but hired somebody, him, though. Somebody powered him up. Yeah, somebody paid him to do that, and I'm not seeing um, who it was. And I'm was. wondering if that just got, yeah, got all flummoxed somewhere in the secret, or Civil War one that came out, because I don't recall them ever referring to it again. Or if they did... I don't know. I, I just maybe one of you listeners know this better than we do. Just send us a quick note and let us know. And if you send your Wait a second, I'll send, look send your well. No, you got to talk about your geeking now. And while you do that, I'm going to go see if WeaponBrown dot com is still a website. Okay. Um, I really only have a few things I'm geeking on. The first one, um, I am a huge fan of Criterion DVDs and Blu-rays. They are kind of the top of the line. They do film restoration. When they come out with a DVD, they not only do the restoration and get the best print possible, but they put out deluxe versions for people who love a movie. Um, usually there's uh, not just director commentary, but they try to cram, cram as many commentaries as they can. You, they will get members of the cast, they'll get the writer, they'll get uh, film historians. They have tons of um, extra features uh, I just recently, they just put out the Lone Wolf and Cub collection, which has all, all of the Lone Wolf and Cub movies, and a documentary on the, them being made that's over two hours long, and a documentary on the comic, and an interview with the comic creators, and an interview with the, with the directors, and et cetera, et cetera. They and Turner Classic Movies got together and did a streaming service that launched last fall. But until now, it's not been available on Roku. This week, they announced it's available 
on Roku, so I will finally be signing up. I didn't want to... I didn't want to sign up and then have to take it and, okay, I can use my phone and then use my phone to cast it to my TV. Nope, I just want it on the TV. And the beautiful thing about Filmstruck is they don't just have the movies. They've got the commentary. They've got the extras. They've got the, uh, the, the all of it. It's like having all of the Criterion DVDs now. So, um, signing up for that this weekend and I, 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 it's supposed to be really hot, but I may not leave the house. I yeah. also have a lot of recording. Yeah, I'm going to gonna crank up that AC. It's supposed to start getting humid tomorrow, so yeah, you're definitely going to want to hang it up. Yeah, I've got uh, three recordings this weekend, and you and I need to get together and record the uh, next uh, Master of Kung Fu uh, series and review episode. I so know. Let's, let, let's start thinking about that. Um. In my previews box, as I have talked about repeatedly, I got the Marvel Monster Bus. It is a reprint of many of the Kirby monsters from the late 50s and early 60s. One of the things that I've learned, the person in charge of the Marvel Masterworks is very active on the Marvel Masterworks website answering questions. And he has said that the, Sil- the Golden Age and Atlas Age books are dead. They won't be doing any more of them because they just did not, the last few did not sell well enough for them to continue. So what we have is what we're going to have. Um, the cost of restoration is way too much. However, he said that if these Marvel monster buses do well, they may be able to do more of the older Golden Age and, and Atomic Age stuff as omnibuses. Omnibus. And the other thing about the omnibus is it's larger than the comic itself. So the art's blown up a little bit more. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful package. Um, and all this wonderful Kirby art. Most of these stories I have read before, but I've read them in crappy reprints from the 70s where the pages are faded and the the reproduction wasn't that good, and they'd cut a page out here or there. I'm not saying that these stories are brilliant. I'm not even saying these stories are good. But I am saying that, man, I love these stories. Come on, giant ants, Groot, Zax. I am Groot. You can't do better than that. And uh, the last thing I'm geeking on, Tomorrow's puts out books as well as the magazines. And the problem with their books is they do such a shitty job of selling them. Um, like the Chronicles of the Chronicles of the American Comic Book. I didn't pick those up because I read it. It was like, I'm not paying $41. And, you know, you get like the two lines that say, this is a history of comics from the 60s. Well, I know the history of comics in the 60s. I know the history of comics from the 70s. But I finally... Somebody said, no, 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 you really want these. So I picked up a couple, and they're great. They gather together all these interviews, and they gather the sales data, and they jam it all together. And one of the books that when they put the ad out, I kind of went, ugh. <laughs> but I decided that after my experience with that, that, you know, tomorrow's just can't sell anything. We're shit. So I ordered, despite the fact that the ad was so bad, Hero A Go Go. Uh-oh. Hero A Go Go is a book about the camp era of superheroes. And it has the comics, and it has the, the, t- the Batman TV show, and the other superhero TV shows, and superhero TV shows that never came out, and the hero boom in cartoons, and on and on and on. It even has the, um, the Monkeys comic book. Ooh! And it has some facts that I did not know. Ooh. So, Joe, here's the fact that I was teasing you with a little earlier. This is a Ask the Joe, and I guarantee you will not get it right. Well, what fun is that? I can barely Bert pronounce Ward, my name right. Burt Ward put out an album at the height of the Batman fame. Who wrote, who wrote it, played most of the music on it, and produced it? Hmm. I wasn't aware he had done one. I neither was I. I would, now I, I would, have to own. I would it. have to say, oh, I don't know, Frank Zappa. 
Exactly. Sorry. Frank Zappa. <laughs> it was a, I put Burt Ward album and it popped up. Mainly because I was, I was looking at the eBay's thinking, oh, yeah, i got to go pick me up one of them. Yes, Frank Zappa was the person behind the Burt Ward album. I read that and I went, no. Yeah. Looked it up and, nope, it's true. It's damn true. Uh, I, I, I don't. I do not see any on the eBay's. I'll have to. I'll have to look. I will say uh, the Weapon Brown website's up. The books are not. They are either sold out or just plain out of print. Nobody's got them on the Amazon. However, if you are dead set on getting one, uh, write this number down and go to your eBay's. Two six three zero zero five five two nine zero zero nine, because somebody's got a huge set from this creator. It includes not only his deep fried stuff, but also the second edition of the Weapon Brown book. And he's asking at what I think is a reasonable price, like thirty four bucks with five dollars shipping. So he also has a couple of the uh, uh, deep fried where. So Weapon Brown 1 through 4, which is complete, signed. A number of smaller books. Uh, Weapon Brown, The Blockhead War, which I didn't realize was an actual comic book. So if you want to see what I've been raving about, take that number I said earlier, plop it down, or go to uh, Troop 295. And uh, I mean, I'm tempted to buy it just because he's got stuff I don't have. But I, I'm going to sit back, and, and this, this your podcast will drop. And, you, folks, you got till Tuesday after this podcast. If you didn't buy it, I'm going to. Uh, Joe, I have the answer to your question. I, I had a question? Oh, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, Electro was hired by Electra to break um, Sauron from the raft. Okay. However, oh. it wasn't the real Electra. It was one of the Skull, Skrull Lords who was in hiding on Earth getting ready for the secret invasion. So they they pretty much did the whole thing. Yep. Oh, see, I haven't gotten to that far in the reading yet. So it was just a matter if I just sat, if I just had sat down, calmly read the volume, we, we would have had 15 minutes less of the podcast for you to enjoy. So it's a good thing. I, I am never calm. You're welcome. Yes. Well, believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on for an hour and a half about funny books. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most. Joe? What do you call the casino near Wonder Woman's home? Pair of Dice Island. Hit my music. <laughs>